Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest edition of the Frankenstein chat. And I don't actually know the number of it. I think it's something like 80. I think it's 80. It's 86. 86? No, it's 86. Yeah. The reason why I'm confused is that what I've been doing over the last couple of weeks, colleagues, is I've been uh, started jogging again. And, and believe it or not, I'm not listening to music. I'm playing my way back through various episodes of the Frankenstein chat. So uh, I got to Lucy Truman, which is, I think, late November. So that's where I'm going. So if you've been a guest here before, I will be getting back to you <laughs> in due course. But anyway, let's move on. We have a, a really eminent guest with us today. Uh, we have uh, Dame Alison Peacock. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Alison. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to talking to you both. Well, it's fantastic. Stan and I, yeah. I can't believe we've got you joining us this morning. It's a real pleasure because these, these just started a little chat between Stan and myself and they've grown into something way, way bigger than we ever thought. But anyway, how are you this morning, Stan? I'm, I'm good this morning. Um, I don't know why. It just feels like a good morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we, we have uh, um, got another extraordinary week. Um, to reflect on um, and just to remind everybody um, whatever the events are and wherever we draw them from we always try and bring them back to a school setting or an education setting uh, sometimes we choose topics which are clearly education other times we choose random things but we always try and relate them back so uh, that's that's where we're going with the chat um, so let's go to uh, Stan first uh, what's caught your eye this week Stan? Um, I think I'm back on my favourite topic of, uh, of the words that politicians use and non-denial denials, which goes back, as I think I've said before, to Watergate. Watergate was the first time the phrase non-denial denial, which says somebody is suggesting that something never happened, but doesn't actually say those words. And yesterday is with the uh, revelation that... Uh, people were being put under pressure to, to change their minds by, according to what was reported, blackmail. Um, the, the first response was, I've not seen any evidence of it. Mm. And, and Frank, you know as well as I do, that not having evidence doesn't make any judgment whatsoever. Mm. Not mm. having evidence means you've not found the evidence, not that it didn't happen or it isn't happening. And it, it's a way of, of just knocking things back, I think, and, or making it look like you're you're asserting that that's not happened and for somebody who's the prime minister i think to say i haven't seen any evidence i'm not sure how credible that is of yeah. somebody who didn't see evidence of a party in his own back garden yeah. i do think though it's about leadership really under pressure you know i think that you know that when it is under pressure um and we know that but but the people around need to be careful about what they do in those circumstances mm. And if, if the whips are, are doing what they normally do, but at a higher sense, a higher level, then they're open to, to damaging the, the whole process. And it do, won't take much to damage it even further. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we, I know we like to take it back to school. So I was thinking, you know, how often when I was ahead, was I either trying to persuade staff to do something that maybe they were uncomfortable with, or how many times did the governors try to, to convince me to change policy or to take up a policy that I wasn't completely happy with. And I know the process is for that, but I don't think I was ever put on, well, I would hope I'd never move from my own standards and, and my own values um, to, serve, to self-serve in effect. Uh, but I know when I wanted to get something through staff that I thought was, was controversial or thought was tricky, I would spend time with with each member of staff uh, and and talk it through so we, we had a, a balanced approach if we could. Mm. plus there was the advantage then of when we went to the staff meeting i knew everybody was on my side so the staff meeting wasn't controversial yeah. but yeah um so I, I just think the use of words particularly at the moment is really interesting and i think you've got to pick out just the little bits of what people are not saying when they make their bold statements. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Alison, I mean, before you start on what's caught your eye, remiss me, I mean, there may be a few people watching this or listening to this who don't know who you are. So do you want to just sort of introduce yourself <laughs> so that those people know? Well, how did this woman get Dame Alison Pico? How did these two lads get Dame Alison Pico? Who is this woman? Who is this woman? So uh, I've been a teacher 
all of my career and most latterly a head teacher. And now I lead the Chartered College of Teaching as the CEO. And I'm, uh, I'm also passionate about trying not to label people, trying not to um, limit possibilities for people. Um, so I've been involved in research called Learning Without Limits. And that does um, underpin, I hope, all of my teaching and my leadership and my leadership now at the Chartered College. So I think it's all very relevant to what Stan's just been saying, actually, because it's about creating a climate of trust wherever you are. If you're a classroom teacher, if you're a head of department, school leader, CEO, whoever it is within education, if you can take people with you, if they can understand the vision, if you can, if you can build a kind of energy around what might be possible to achieve that, that benefits everybody, then trust builds. But equally, trust is so, uh, you know, easily lost. It's quite and fragile, really, isn't it, really? Because really the, the, little, the little thing can act as, mm. uh, uh, can, can escalate very, very quickly. Um, you know, even just a little lie. There isn't such thing as a little lie, is there? There is a lie. No, completely. I mean, a trust is 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 hard won and easily yeah. lost. I would say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's yeah, interesting. I put, I put my honesty down to the fact that my memory isn't good, and I know if I tell a lie, I won't remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's much easier to be straight on, right from the start. On that um, on that uh, run that I had last night, um, where I was listening to Stan talking to Lucy Truman, it was the Stan and Lucy show on that uh, chat, Stan. But it was really interesting how Lucy um, and Stan were both stressing how um, a different type of leadership or the value of a, a leadership style that actually is willing to say, look, I need everybody to help me make the right decision. Yeah, and yeah, I this think is that, so tough. You know, I I can't make this decision accurately or well on my own. No, and and that that, that core principle of openness at the heart of leadership, I think, is is so fundamental. Because in terms of what you've just been saying, you know, seeking collaboration to make the best decision, but then also being open to recognizing that maybe the decision isn't quite the right one or that there are nuances that need to be understood or listened to and there needs to be a, a change, of, a change of direction. But uh, it's always about taking responsibility for the decisions that you take. Um, and then, you know, as I say, you can change course, but um, you take people with you. Yeah. You don't just uh, deny any culpability, as, as I think we've seen this week. Yeah, it's interesting. I was going to say, engaging with lots of, of staff on something doesn't mean to say you mustn't raise the expectation that because everybody wants to go in a particular direction, if you as the leader know that's not the direction that you're heading in, you, you, you take all that consultation, you have all those, and you say, well, thanks, I've, I've involved everybody in this, but actually this is the way I want us to go and I, and I want you with me on this. And if you've got that level of trust and if people do respect you for where, what you've done before, what you intend to do, then people will follow you. And that's that's crucial, I think. I, I think and that's, that's why... Say, the other thing, Frank, is putting people around you who are just as good and just as challenging. Well, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, been, that's, been, that's, that's been the saviour of my career. <laughs> well, as Lucy Truman proved, Stan, somebody who yeah. worked for you yeah. really Lucy has improved your... Yeah. Um, but actually... But yeah, it's it's that, that, we will get to what's you. called we will get to what's called Alison's eye in a minute but the key thing I think for new leaders is choosing what the major reform is early on the order in which you tackle things I think is quite important as well and, and perhaps not sufficient regards given to that they immediately a new leader of a school comes in and they say well the big issue we need to tackle is this actually that means you're up against a, a, a significant challenge straight away you need to think very carefully about you know what what you need to do to lead into that decision and that might involve a way of working but that might actually involve tackling some smaller easier wins to build confidence and trust in your decision making and to actually trial out the way in which we're going to work as a team to resolve it i think more needs to be given consideration i think given to that as a strategy somebody said to me as first headship just change uh, primary head just change the hooks in the in the uh, in the cloakroom because everybody says those hooks are rubbish, you know, so just do that. You can't fail, you know, and everyone's quite happy. The coats don't fall on the floor, but things like that, actually, I'm not suggesting that every head does that, but, but something for me, that was something that I did. 
um, and it was successful. And it started people thinking that here's somebody who wants to consult with me and talk about things that are a pain, really. Um, anyway, what's caught your eye this week then, Alison? Um, <clears throat> well, there's been so many things. I think um, <laughs> building on what you've just said, I was asked to review a book that um, John Hattie has contributed to, it hasn't yet come out. And he's talking, that group are talking about how do you define the core problem within your school or your group of schools or at a system level and taking time to define what the issue is mm -hmm. that most needs addressing is something that you're never going to waste time with. So, you know, at the micro level as a head teacher, I think, you know, when I came into headship, I said, this is a listening school. And it was really about listening and tapping into what are the things that most, as you say, most irritate people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they can be really small things, but they have huge impact on the community. And that notion of taking people with you, listening to what the issues are, it's not about a lack of leadership. It's about defining what are the things that are holding us back? What are the opportunities that we could seize hold of that could make a massive difference? Um, and how do we go with all of this? And I think the other thing is, you know, the job of headship and leadership is so complex, isn't it? You, you know, it's not just one thing. You can't just focus on one thing and, and ignore everything else. But it's about how you balance all those priorities. So that book has caught my eye. And also uh, this huge tome. I didn't realise it was so thick. I just realised it was so thick. I mean, well, when it comes to the letterbox. Well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I thought the Cambridge Primary Review was the biggest book. Yeah. That I'd ever been, you know, like that was that was pretty weighty. And I used to carry that around with me for years because I was working with Robin Alexander. This is bigger, but, um, and I've got some time set aside to read it uh, this weekend. But I'm really hopeful that there are some very wise observations in this because it's you know it's full of interviews with lots of people who've been very influential over the years in education um can't wait to dip in and find out yeah. what they say yeah um well uh what's caught my eye this week um is uh, i'm not going to sort of make a comment about uh, systematic synthetic phonics i think there's been a big report out from uc uh, two professors um bradbury and wise from the ucl about um you need to read the paper. I think that's probably one of the issues. <laughs> don't don't pick up on Twitter comments. Don't pick up just on reading the TS summary of it. Read the paper. And uh, again, Stan, it, it's the point that that we you've made today, but also we've made every week. It's very nuanced, and it's basically you know the headline is is it a reading war or reading reconciliation or that sort of thing. You know. And actually, I think the nuance is in the reading reconciliation, you know, that actually what this is doing is not it, it is it is suggesting that we need to think very critically about the systematic synthetic phonics, not just that approach, but what the government and others have done to drive that home. And and actually a school, you know, it's really interesting. I spoke to a couple of primary teachers this week. They had no idea this report had been published, you know, and for me, because I've got time. You know, I'm not in I'm not having to prepare lessons today. You know, I'm not having to mark books. I'm not having to do all the stuff that goes with doing a job. You know, this is a, a the point for me is very much around um, two things. Senior leaders need to find time to take stock of what this means for their school. But secondly, I think there's a real danger here where the response to that report from some colleagues has been sort of very damning. Um, and actually, I think the issue here is around we need to allow more time for reflection and for us to take stock of what this paper means to our practice rather than just cut it off, <laughs> cut it off from the waste, you know, as if because this is a potential risk to a drive that, that has come centrally. And the point I want, the second point that I want to make, apart from the reflection, is that there's a real risk here, a danger that actually if government drives a particular methodology whether that's through Ofsted, whether that's through you know, a screening test or whatever it may be, if that is discredited, it's the government that take the flag. And the profession say to the government, look, you know, some of us wanted a more nuanced approach here, a more balanced approach, which is what Wise and Bradbury are suggesting. But actually, we've been driven down this road. Now, whether that's right or wrong is you know, slightly irrelevant. The issue here is that as soon as governments start dictating on pedagogy, there is a fall going to come because I think we've always said, Stan, the middle ground is the safe ground. 
you know yeah. and you need to you swing around a little bit but if you're swinging too wildly that's neither good for you i think nor good for the children who are learning you know actually this needs to move in a structured way towards a new position um, and I think there is a real concern I have, uh, again, about too much interference centrally on stuff that happens and, and not sufficient flexibility and freedom for, for, for teachers to, or for schools, not just teachers, can't have individual teachers. This needs a, a joined up approach to it. So that's the point I was going to make. And I could throw loads of other stuff in, but I've decided not to. <laughs> <laughs> I think that... Um... Reports like this are so important because it's always about, you know, any evidence or anything that purports to be evidence, any research is always subject to review, always subject to scrutiny, always subject to being revised. And so, you know, this is the whole point of the Chartered College of Teaching. It's about building professional dialogue and debate, respectful dialogue and yes. debate about any of the issues that impact our children's learning fundamentally. And so reports like this deserve close scrutiny. They deserve uh, you know, the opportunity for colleagues in schools to look and to think and to reflect. I think the vast majority of schools do take a much more balanced approach to yes. the teaching of reading. Um, but there are, there, there are sort of um, examples that I've certainly heard of where schools have said, oh, we can't teach that song anymore because it's teaching the letters in the wrong order and all this kind of thing. <laughs> Um, and we can't read that story because the time isn't right to, to read a text like this. I think that um, that notion of a plurality of, of voices being yeah. able to um, explore the issues and to really uh, encourage debates in the best possible way. And you're quite right, teachers are incredibly busy. And this is what leads to this sort of um, swinging from one yeah. point of view to the other <laughs> or, or popularist sort of, this is the way to go. So that's what led to the sort of, adoption of brain gym you know it felt in primary classrooms brain gym felt like common sense not because it was about the brain but because it was about breaking up a lesson giving children a chance to move around getting them to do something different then sit down again mm -hmm. now actually any good teacher knows that's what you have to do whether well, you with space I'll, learning i'll be or going off for a coffee after this Alison. I won't be sitting here, I'll be getting up and walking about a bit. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, you know, we wouldn't want to call it brain gym, but we would want to call it, you know, being able to connect and understand the mood and the needs of very young children when they're learning. And I think in terms of, of this report that's come out this week, as you say, we must go beyond the headline. We need to really understand what's being suggested here. And part of what's being suggested, of course, is that if you have a check that is high stakes, it's going to pervert yeah. behaviour. And we kind of know that. We know it all the way through the system, don't we? Yes, yeah. yeah. I think the other thing people need to, people, it's great when you say people need to, but <laughs> it, you, you, need to, you need to ask yourself before you make a response to any of this is, am I already in a camp? Because I, I do think the country as a whole, we, we jump into A or B, we, you know, whether it was Brexit, whether it was vaccinations mm. or whatever, and, and there's no middle ground anymore. You're either for it or against it. And I think some of the responses on Twitter, immediate responses on, on Twitter and social media have been because people haven't thought yet, well, am I, am I defending this or am I attacking it because of my position where I am now without looking at the, at the report, without reading it and saying, mm. well, you know, maybe, maybe there are some elements of it that I could consider we just don't seem to be in that world very often it seems to be if it doesn't agree with me it's it's rubbish yeah you know, I mean, and that, that's it's, it, it is also very interesting when you read the ucl press release and i did read the report but the the, the key word is the dominance of synthetic yeah. phonics you know systematic synthetic phonics or it actually uses synthetic phonics doesn't use systematic and and actually that that the word dominance is crucial because it's actually just asking you, isn't it? It's, it's, that leads you to then consider, have we over-dominated the curriculum in, in early years in reception, year one, year two, and even into secondary school, where I believe that the phonics program is being rolled out there for, for, for weak readers. But actually, have we over-dominated that? And, and I think that's a really, the, the use of the word dominance, I think is a really good word if it means just let me let's just stand back and think about this you know what's that experience like what's the impact of this on our on our children but like Alison, I, I i can't 
you know, whenever I've talked to teachers, whenever I've seen t- teachers talking about reading, whether they've been doing it for 25 years or two years, nobody's ever said to me, we, that's all we do. Mm. That, you know, mm. it's, it's everything. And it's what works with this particular child for most teachers, which is why teaching is such a hard job. Yeah, and it is about building professional knowledge. It's about, you know, again, my whole passion for the Chartered College is built on my own experience of of being a teacher and a leader, buoyed up, backed by research in terms of what I was doing, because it gave me so much more confidence that I could ask questions. I was asking about what's the best way to enable children to develop? How can we do something that will find a way through for this particular learner? What can we do to support this particular teacher who isn't necessarily flourishing in this context, but maybe they could flourish in a different context? You know, once you've got that kind of, I guess, professional confidence and intellectual curiosity, then you're not going to just take on board any kind of policy that that lands on your desk and say, right, slam dunk, that's the way to do it. You're going to you're going to look at it and try and make sense of it in the best possible way you can as a professional. And for me, that's at the heart of of what we need to be doing through um, developing a a chartered college. It's about, as I say, the debate, the dialogue, the the nuance, what works well in my context. And it's not about debunking things and saying, oh, well, we'll we'll forget all about that theory about phonics and we'll do something completely different. It's not about, you know, oh, let's go back to real reading, real books, and we'll forget phonics. It's much more about nuance and and understanding, you know, what are the issues that were being explored by the researchers? How might this have impacted our practice here? Might we do something slightly differently? Um, Do we have the breadth of of, uh, approaches that mean that we're not being over-dominated by something? And what would lead lead to that over-dominance? Yeah, yeah. I think there's always a risk as well that somebody finds something that works and assumes that's that's the answer and everybody can duplicate it and uh, Frank, yeah. Frank and I had an experience when we were inspecting of a, a school up in, in Cumbria who did some stunning artwork absolutely stunning yeah. artwork and I was still ahead at that point I do remember Stan just to explain this yeah. they were doing colour mixing with watercolours on the induction days for children joining the reception class you know and it and the work was unbelievable the children were painting hyacinths that were recognizable as hyacinths <laughs> using the using the three colors and mixing them we were just blown up and i, I said right we're going to do this with my reception wait till i get back i think after 40 minutes i think i t- tore everything up and stormed out <laughs> yeah, but everything was... everything in the hands of a of a passionate expert teacher yeah. can work yes. you know, and, and Phil point. and william talks about everything works somewhere and you know nothing works yeah. everywhere and i i think that's that's so important but it's also part of the joy of collaboration isn't it because it is about yeah. finding ideas of from a school in cumbria or from a school down there in hampshire and thinking how can we how can we build this into what we're doing You know, you see it when you visit schools, as I know you two have done uh, throughout your careers and and, and I have as well. You see kinds of things developing in schools that you think, I I saw that, you know, 200 (laughs) miles away. Um, It's it's amazing how things develop and how, particularly I think in the primary sector, how we do want to learn from each other. So making sure that we're learning really good things as opposed to just what what feels like it might be a good idea. And an example of that would be, just before I led headship, there was a school, I don't know where they were, who um, had massively improved their behavior management. And when they were interviewed about what they'd done, they'd said, we asked all the children to wear slippers. And you could kind of think, you know, there must've been head teachers humming down the land saying, right, quick, order slippers. (laughs) That's gonna sort out the behavior management. And of course, it may well have been the thing for them that they focused on. Yes. But actually it's not going to on its own any more than color mixing on the first no, day yeah, she's yeah. Gonna do it. it's not going to sort it is it <laughs> <laughs> or or changing the pegs on the cloakroom in the cloakroom i mean uh, <laughs> but it is about culture change isn't it i mean i i think one of the things and, and you're on to slippers i i put carpet in the room much against much against the advice of of my local area who said you'll, you'll be changing those every two years it'll cost you a fortune but it was about saying to the children this is a workspace that we value and, and we want to invest in it because it'll be nicer, it'll be less dusty, mm. it'll be quieter, 
you'll be able to work better. And, and it was that, that that made the difference, the culture, not the carpet, but the carpet was... Can I just say, that's bigger. rubbish, uh, Alison. That was all about a stroppy caretaker and Stan being annoyed <laughs> every time at the end of the day when the caretaker come down or the cleaner come down. Have you seen the state of those floors in that classroom? That's what it was about, Stan. Well, that was when I was a teacher, Frank. <laughs> I, I had a quote from my caretaker to say, well, I thought you were the worst in terms of tidy, but this beats everything. Plaster of Paris. We had, we had a whole afternoon on making plaster of Paris bricks, and it looked like a snow scene in my room. Oh, on the floor. That, was, that was brave. <laughs> Alison, do you want to just... Uh, I, I mean, I, 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 uh, we met on a, uh, on, a, on a, sorry, like a, a dating agency, but we met online <laughs> um, at, with a conference where we were both speaking. I think we were both in the same sort of section and uh, I mean I've spoken to you a few times since but I, I have to say uh, you know I, I was aware of the the college but I, until we spoke I hadn't actually understood how much support there was and what members actually get from it and and actually relates doesn't it to the phonics in a way yeah. you know um, I don't know if you want to just sort of use this platform just to explain a little bit more about what goes on and 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 how the stuff that we've been talking about today it's not countered but is support the college supports teachers in this yes well, well thank you i mean moving from headship i was just really keen that we try to create um, a voluntary organization the chartered college of teaching that uh, is in a place to share best practice that can share ideas, that can encourage debate, that can make sure that research findings are presented, not dumbed down, but presented in a way that are accessible to teachers. So we produce a journal three, um, sometimes four times a year. The journal's always themed. We've got a, a detailed website with lots of videos and information for teachers, not about lesson planning and, and you know, what you do to fill your day, but about the whole notion of professionalism, pedagogy, building expertise. And we're really keen to develop chartered status amongst the profession. Now, this is really about giving teachers recognition for the work that they do and making sure that um, to achieve chartered status, you can't just go and um, talk a good game and fill in a few boxes. And you know you have to be able to impact on your classroom practice, show videos of classroom practice, engage in examinations. I mean, you know, I'm probably making it sound dreadful, but actually people <laughs> love it. People love the fact yeah. that a bit of rigor means that when they are challenged and they overcome that challenge, there's a real sense of um, success that comes from that. So we've already got over, uh, you know, well, nearly 2,000 teachers engaging with the chartered program and we've made it modular, it's online and so on. We really want to, as I say, raise the profile of teachers beyond their early career right the way through to be able to say, you know, this is what I stand for. This is, this is me, this is my professional knowledge, this is career long. And that way, I think we, we, we all benefit from a profession that is a thinking intellectual profession. And when we're less susceptible then, I believe, to the sort of political whim and fancy, that sort of buffeting about that we were talking about earlier that sort of says, well, I either support this or I support that. Yeah. Actually, you know, it's, it's, it's much more nuanced. It's much more about what works for the children in my context, in my school. All schools are different, aren't they? Yeah. And yeah. The yeah. idea that one size fits all um, I know. I know. Is, is not going to be successful. So... Yeah, I mean it's it's exciting and five years old now. So I know. Well, I, I, I'm uh, yeah. We've been to. I mean, there must have been occasion. I'm not trying to sort of get you to sort of reveal stuff that you don't want to reveal here. But the, that that approach, there must be times when governments say, if only the college would take a, a firmer line on this. You know, uh, uh, if anything, we've we've always worked when we were first funded by government. Um, we had to report to government four times a year. And um, <laughs> government wanted us to be less strident about what we were saying. <laughs> um, now that we've become independent of government, yes. um, we still work very closely. Um, uh, we're just trying to make sure that we amplify those aspects of policies that are for the collective good. But where we've got some, some initiatives that are starting to emerge that appear more controlling, that are less about thinking and more about doing as you're told, um, 
we're resistant to that because we believe to be a professional is to make the best decisions that you can. And you can only make those best decisions when you've got all of the information and you've got increasing experience that you can mm. draw on. And you do that by working in collaboration with colleagues. So um, I really believe that the Charter College is, is the future for the teaching profession. And it, it's not mandatory, it's voluntary. So no one's forcing teachers to join, but if you want to join because you want to build your expertise, your knowledge, um, your career, that's the best possible reason for, for wanting to join, isn't it? Um, and we try and be as inclusive as possible. So membership costs are not very high. And I, well, we've got nearly 50,000 members now. Yeah, I, I, I was. I'm just like, whoa, how did that even happen in five years? But I'm yeah. glad it has. And, I, and, and I'm not stopping here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, um, well, believe it or not, um, we've got to uh, 35 minutes of the chat. Uh, it's unbelievable, isn't it? How it yeah, flies past. It's really quick. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think uh, it, if if people are interested in becoming uh, knowing more about the college, there's obviously there's a very interesting or very useful website. Which actually, you don't need to be a member to actually get quite a bit out of. To be honest, uh, <laughs> so I'd urge people to to have a look at that. And and also, um, if you know anybody who wants to make contact. Um, you know about what the college can offer and, and want sort of like my view on that i'm more than happy to to to, to communicate with them so um well it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on this morning and um, thank, thank you so you. much for your time and uh stan i mean who would have thought <laughs> well it's like being interviewed by Morecambe and wise i mean from my point of view it's just fantastic so. <laughs> I hope you're not going to say which is which. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not going any further. <laughs> uh, okay, well, uh, colleagues, uh, thank you for joining us this uh, this week. Um, so it, it, this appears on YouTube and also on various pod, uh, podcast sites, so including Spotify and what have you. So uh, and numbers are increasing, and and we're just very grateful. And I, and as we say, uh, Stan and I will just witter on with each other to ourselves and just record it. Uh, be, even if nobody watched, because the, the key for us was this was just meant to be uh, a record, our record of the, in effect, the pandemic. And we have been running since um, May the 1st, 2020. And uh, we will be heading towards our 100th edition um, around that time uh, in 2022. And uh, I suspect we'll carry on until Frank can't press the button anymore or can't work out the technology or whatever it might be. But anyway, thank you all for joining us and uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. And thank you, Alison, again. Yeah, thank you very much.